Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the 2023 Longmont City Council debates produced by Longmont Public Media in partnership with the League of Women Voters and sponsored by Sustainable Resilient Longmont. This is the at-large debate. I'm your host, Faith Halverson Ramos. In alphabetical order from left to right, our candidates Steve Altshuler, Sean McCoy, McCoy and Becca Federella. I'll call on each candidate to give a one minute opening statement and we ask that the audience remain silent and again ensure that your cell phones are turned on silent or airplane mode. So Steve, would you like to give us your opening sure. statement? My name is Steve Altschuler. I'm actually retired, but I'm running for Longmont City Council because for the last four or five years, I've been going to more and more city council meetings and I've seen many times that the council seems to ignore what the public is most interested in. They seem to have their own agenda, which to a large extent is high density, low income housing. And I think a lot of people moved to Longmont to get away from that. They didn't want to live in Denver. They didn't want to live in Boulder. They wanted a little more open space. And I always believe in less government control and more freedom for the people to choose how they want to live and then follow through with that. Thank you. Sean, would you like to give your yeah. opening statement? Uh, thank you, Longmont Public Media, uh, for hosting this uh, forum and faith. Uh, as your current Longmont City Council member, I feel I've been prudent, thoughtful, and focused on policies that the community supports and wants the city to address. I'm asking for your vote and support. I was born and raised in Longmont. Uh, I've been married for 31 years, and I have two beautiful adult daughters. I feel I have a lot to offer after three decades of serving on multiple city and county boards and commissions, as well as serving as a Longmont City Councilman from 2007 to 2011, and currently serving as your Longmont City Councilman for a special, after a special election in November. I want to continue to do the good work for Longmont and focus on affordable housing and other aspects of our community that are really important. So please vote for me. I'm not running against anybody, but I'm running for a long run. Thank you. Thank you. Becca. Hi there. My name is Becca Venturello. I am running for city council at large because um, my cousin was murdered at the Michigan State University mass shooting. Um, and then four days prior, one of my aunts took her life. When I got back from those two funerals, I knew that I had to do something. I had to get involved because gun violence is happening everywhere, as we know. And... Um, it's not if, it's when it'll come to this community. So I believe we need to have a survivor in that seat that will push these things forward and hold things accountable so that we're not the next city with a, a catastrophe like what happened in Boulder. Um, I have a mom, I have two young kids, a five year, soon to be five year old and a 19 month old, um, and a husband, I've been with him for 14 years. We have lived in Boulder County for since 2009 and um, I love this community, I love it. So I can't wait to be here, and I hope I get to bring our communities together um, and represent you. Thank you. Thank you for the, your statements. Next, I will read the rules of the debate and then ask the first question of candidate Steve Altshuler. So how this works, the candidate on the left will be asked the first question, which they have one minute to answer. When the answerer is finished or their one minute is up, each of the other participants has 30 seconds to rebut or extend the first answer. Rebuttals move left to right, beginning on the answerer's right and moving round robin. When all candidates have spoken, the candidate to the answerer's right becomes the next answerer. I will then ask a new question of the answerer and rebuttals proceed as before. At the 25 minute mark, the current round of questions and rebuttals is completed, and the lightning round begins. In the lightning round, each candidate answers the same question with a one-word answer. Five questions will be asked. The first question will be answered right to left, beginning with Becca, and the second question will be answered left to right, beginning with Steve. And then going that way until we're done. Uh, with the lightning round. 
When the lightning round is over, the second half of the debate begins. It proceeds as above in steps one, to one through four, except that the first answerer is the rightmost candidate, Becca, and the round robin proceeds right to left. At the 55 minute mark, the debate ends after the current round of questions and rebuttals is completed. I will then call on the candidates left to right to make a one minute closing statement. So, let's begin with our first question. Candidate Altshuler. Should the city spend taxpayer money on lawsuits in pursuit of changes in state law? Should the city sign on to public actions brought by other jurisdictions? That seems a little vague. Um, the first thought that comes to mind with that as far as signing on to lawsuits with other jurisdictions, last year the city council was considering doing a series of red flag logs, which in my mind were in violation of the Second Amendment. And I actually spoke to the city council and I said, the Supreme Court has already ruled on this. Boulder, Lewis, Lafayette, uh, and Superior had already started the same four red flag laws and already had lawsuits going against them. And I spoke to the council and I said, if you proceed with this, you're going to cost the city of Longmont millions of dollars. You're going to waste taxpayer money. And I don't think it's a good use, a good, a good way to use taxpayer money when you already know the outcome. The Supreme Court has already ruled and there's no way Longmont is going to overturn the Supreme Court. Thank you. Candidate McCoy. Thank you. Well, I think that uh, there are certain cases that are really important that we do have to pursue. Uh, things around oil and gas, absolutely. I'd like to pursue things uh, with uh, gun control, and I think that uh, there are some avenues. Myself as a candidate, I have been focusing on the issues around uh, talking to our, our uh, city attorney, our uh, public safety and uh, uh, fire uh, chief about what we can do. But uh, we have been kind of shut down by that, so I'm hoping that we can get moving forward on those in the future. Thank, Thank you. you. Well, thankfully, we already passed the red flag law across the whole state, so we expanded ERPO, so that's already in place. And also, um, I work with organizations who um, have the staff and the attorneys that take on, if we do pass one of these laws here um, around gun violence prevention, that we do not incur any cost um, by putting these measures in place. Um, so yeah, that'll keep the, the weight off of us, and I think it's important we need to do this. We need to do this now. We are behind a lot of cities who've already done it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Our next question. Is there a rebuttal? We were, that was it. That we was, were the rebuttal. Oh, rebuttal. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's okay. So you two be about the one question, oh, and then God. we'll about the next question. <laughs> Too complicated. <laughs> there, are, there are many steps. Yeah. Yes. So this second question, candidate McCoy, uh -huh. you'll get the one minute mm -hmm. answer. All right. Opportunity. So this question is, what is your understanding of Vision Zero? If elected to council, would you vote to repeal the policy, accelerate its implementation, or leave it the way it is on a rough 20-year trajectory? Well, my understanding of Vision Zero is about uh, traffic deaths and uh, moving our community forward with uh, multimodal transportation. And so I think Vision Zero is a good plan. I think it's a way that we are going to be moving forward on our transportation goals. And I think it is important. We hear too often about families that have had somebody that is out uh, just doing their thing on, on the weekend, riding their bike, and they get uh, uh, hit by somebody who just isn't paying attention. Mm -hmm. We need to have some uh, very good traffic uh, mitigation aspects in our community, like roundabouts, dips, and, and bumps, and uh, to slow traffic down. And we have to make people a little bit more conscious of the idea that uh, uh, traffic uh, is also bicycles, <coughs> is also uh, some of the scooters that are out there, and some of the other modes of transportation. And we should be respectful of those people that are out there walking. Thank you. 
Um, I think it's great. We need a vision. We need a plan so that we know where we're going and so we're held accountable so that we can um, continue to grow our community and really work um, for a plan that will really affect all of us and help us out. So I'm all for it. I think um, uh, the issues with pedestrian traffic and the way that we run traffic through our city need to be addressed. So yeah, I'm good. I like Vision Zero. <laughs> That's great. Thank you. So there's always things you can do to help prevent needless traffic accidents. The reality is you will never have zero traffic accidents unless you get rid of all cars and make everybody in every city across the country have to walk places. Um, doing things to mitigate the accidents are a great idea. There's a lot of people that are driving when they're either drunk or on drugs, and those people need to be punished because I think that's a large part of what happens with the accidents. And other than that, you just have to do the best you can and hope for the best result. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question. Do you believe the city is acting with sufficient urgency on the climate emergency resolution? What would you do? I do. Um, we are um, way steps ahead from even Boulder. Um, and I know Boulder is looked at as a very progressive city, but we have done a lot for our community and we own our own grid. Um, and Boulder's been trying to do that since for 30 years and has not attained that. Um, so I think we just continue to support the efforts that are going on and going forward and I really look forward to working with um, our city staff who have been working tirelessly on these um, concerns. So I'm glad the city is doing things to help mitigate um, climate disasters. I don't think it's quite as serious as a lot of people lead you to believe and we can keep doing the things that we've been doing, but it should not be done to the extent of ruining the economy of Longmont and ruining jobs and having an undue burden on people that need to live every day. Well, I'm a big supporter of sustainable, resilient Longmont, and uh, I believe that those who deny those goals are unrealistic are the problem and I choose to be part of the solution. In 2008, when I was on council before, we held the first environmental sustainable uh, conference and expo at Skyline High School to uh, promote uh, uh, recycling, composting, and other aspects of sustainable living in uh, Longmont. Uh, it is estimated that uh, the 2013 floods cost uh, four billion dollars. It's not if something climate change happens, it's when. Thank you. Our next question. We'll be starting back with candidate Hulshuler. Do you support a camping ban within the city of Longmont? Where do these questions come from? Um, camping should be in the parks that are designated for camping. I don't think people should be camping in the middle of the street. You don't want to be camping in parks. Uh, I do know that the homeless is another big situation. A lot of homeless people are camping wherever they can find space. And I don't know if that's more what you're referring to rather than everyday campers. Um, the homeless is a huge problem onto itself. And I do not think they should be camping everywhere. There's a, uh, an article in Boulder where they've almost taken over the playground of a school and the kids are afraid to even leave and go out and play on the playground. So there have to be some controls. Um, camping up in open space, obviously in S's, places like that, is, should be perfectly legal and always be allowed. Thank you. To uh, conflate uh, homelessness uh, with uh, crime and criminal behavior is uh, unfair. And uh, I propose a uh, eminent domain of a parcel of land at Hover and Nelson, the old Walmart building uh, site in the parking lot, to create a short-term RV uh, where we're able to better provide services and a way to get RV campers out of areas of the city where they don't belong. And so I think that uh, we have to show compassion to those that are uh, experiencing homelessness and, uh, and being unhoused. We need housing. Uh, we're in a housing crisis. Um, we do not have enough, and we need to be looking at high density. We need to be looking at places where people can get 
um, care and be able to have a safe place so that they can move throughout the community in a way that they're supported and not just left alone. Um, so yeah, I think we need to really focus on that because when people have a safe place to live, they're more inclined to um, continue to work on um, being a productive member of society. Thank you. Our next question. The Main Street Corridor Plan reflects the city's vision for redevelopment of Main Street from 9th to Highway 66. What do you see as benefits and or risks of proceeding with funding and implementing this plan? Well, uh, I think that it's important that we do something. For a long time, we have uh, made the Downtown Development Authority area from 9th to 1st uh, uh, Avenue uh, our priority. But at some point here, we need to start moving towards uh, that other direction north and uh, trying to figure out how we can make sure that uh, areas of that Main Street corridor uh, are uh, better supported for business and other opportunities. So yes, I support that. Thank you. Um, businesses up there are struggling. I know that a handful of them are like a couple paychecks away from closing. We have to do this to bring um, more flow down that up, down up north, and um, so that these communities can get more foot traffic and get more um, recognition, so that they are not sitting on the edge of if they're going to be able to last or if they're not. So we can't just forget about that side of town. So obviously, we're all pretty much in agreement here. The businesses in North Longmont do need more support. It'd be great to do something like unity in the community up north, so you're drawing a lot of people up there. They can learn what kind of businesses are up there. Last night at Unity in the Community, I was talking to a lady that told me one of her employees actually quit because the homeless were camped right in front of her store, and the employee didn't even feel comfortable going into the stores. So if the employee doesn't feel comfortable, you can bet customers aren't feeling comfortable either. So it's, it's a bigger problem than just getting more traffic up there. Our next question, you'll get the answer. Mm -hmm. What inspired you to run for office? The loss of my cousin. Um, uh, my grandmother, when my mom was seven, took her life with a gun. Um, and I lived with that. I lived with that trauma throughout my life to know it, how it impacted my mom and their family. So then, fast forward to what just happened to me recently, that is, I have two young kids, um, and I think it's pretty apparent that this is what I'm doing this for. And also, I just can't sit on the sidelines while um, women's rights are being taken away, while the climate crisis is happening, while people are so close to being broke. I can't sit on the sideline. I have to use my voice, um, and that's very important to me. Because I can sit, if, if I can't do anything, then why do I sit and talk about it? So this is my, my effort in, um, bring an impact to our city and our state. Thank you. I call myself a constitutionalist and a free market capitalist. I've actually been in business for 35 years and I've got different ways of looking at things. When I've gone to city council meetings, I see what I define as a lot of socialism and that's not how I want our country to be headed. So that is why I decided to run for office because again, I have a 19 year old daughter. Mm -hmm. And I, want, I can't do much in Washington, I can't do much in Denver, but there is something I can do to help Longmont regain its constitutional focus. Well, I'm a high school teacher for Boulder Valley School District. I teach U.S. Gov, U.S. History, and, and Economics. And from a U.S. Gov point of view, I think students absolutely are terrified of, uh, of someday a gunman coming into their home. So I agree that that is one of the biggest issues. And as an economics teacher, I think I have a lot to offer mm -hmm. uh, from an economic point of view, Longmont's success. And I want to see Longmont successful in every level, not only the worker, but the employer as well. Thank you. Our next question. <clears throat> What would you do to prevent vandalism in public outdoor restrooms? Mm. That's me. Okay. No. It's <laughs> in public outdoor. I, 
wasn't aware that was a big problem. Vandalism is a huge problem. Um, and that comes right back down to police and punishment. Uh, I do know that with COVID, trying people for crimes was way backed up because the courthouses were closed. I was talking to an officer the other day and they were saying that they're still short one judge in Boulder. So we should make it a point to get up to full force, get the judges there. And then when you arrest people, you can try them and hopefully convict them and punish them if they're guilty. Um, but any kind of vandalism or crime that's going on in the city, if you don't have some kind of punishment, it's just going to get worse and worse. Well, uh, in the 90s, my father uh, was on city council and uh, he helped put in the fiber optic uh, ring. He brought that to Longmont. And then in 2008, we put up an election uh, to put that, implement that into the system, and it lost. In 2009, we made it happen. And so because of that, Next Light and our camera systems in our parks are what makes our parks a lot safer today. So that's what's critical to making those uh, areas of our community safer when nobody is looking. And you don't have to have a policeman there every day to make that happen. Um, I, I don't know the full details of this, but I had heard that they are working on something, I believe it might be in Boulder, um, then it'll come to Longmont with the public restrooms where there'll be, um, it's a lock, you only have so much time in the bathroom and then everything shuts down so that they're keeping people from camping in the, in the bathrooms and keeping them clean and then same with like cameras so we need to invest in that because that would be a huge help because we need our restrooms open especially in our parks. Thank you. Our next question, and this will be starting with you, Candidate McCoy. Today, many parts of Old Town have low amperage electrical services. Residents who want to electrify their homes to a greater extent have to pay to upgrade their service. Should the city cover this cost for low income residents, for all residents? Well, uh, this is a big issue because I think uh, there is such a large portion of Longmont. Having grown up in the old part of town, I can tell you that, yeah, there are probably uh, some real problems there, and I, and I recognize that. And so I think what we have to understand is that as far as it comes for our low-income residents that live in that part of uh, our community and that are dealing with that, we do probably need to come up with some sort of formula or program that actually supports them getting their their homes uh, up to the current standard. Uh, as far as uh, uh, a citywide blanket uh, aspect of providing that for, for everyone, I think it's probably uh, something that uh, we'll have to further explore what the, the uh, uh, aspects of that would actually entail. Um, that I like that question, I'm trying to think. <laughs> um, I think we need to get creative and possibly talk to our state legislators. Um, I know that there's a lot of federal funds out there for updating um, our system so we're not, it's more economic and we're not um, draining our energy resources. So I would like to get creative with that and speak to my, our legislators here and see what they can do to pull federal funds down. Honestly, I didn't realize that that was a problem in parts of Longmont, that there wasn't enough power for the electrical, for the, whatever the homes need. I do know that the city of Longmont is looking into doing the smart meters, and that will control more the flow of energy from one time to another. My fear with that is I, I am in favor of smaller government. I don't want government controlling when I can turn electricity on, because if they can control that, they can control turning everything off. I think individual homeowners should be responsible for upgrading their homes. Thank you. Our next question. If the minimum wage were raised, do you expect that there would be a loss of tax base? Please support your argument. Um, I'm all for raising the minimum wage. Uh, it's too expensive to live here. I have spoken with some businesses about this, and um, this one lady who owns a business, a shop in Longmont, said, "My um, the lowest paid employee at my office makes $17 an hour. Now, I know this is it's going to be conflicting across the board. It's not all one way, but um, we need to. We need to do this because people are working. My father is working six days a week. 
Um, and he's a 30 year Marine retired vet. And that stick make ends meet. We have to do something. We have to raise the minimum wage so people can afford to be in our community. Because if not, they're going to leave. Um, my dad's brought that up. He, he's like, this is so expensive to live in Colorado. So yeah, we need to bring that up and we need to support our workers um, so that they can stay in our community. I've also talked to a number of businesses in town, and what I keep hearing is that if the minimum wage, they're talking about raising it from $15 to $25 in the next four and a half years. That's like a 65% increase. And the business people that I've spoken to are just afraid that they're gonna to have to lay people off and, and can't stay in business that way. Minimum wage has never helped anybody because it raises the cost of everything you buy, and within a year or two, everything is right back the way it is. The best way to help people is to help them get more education and increase their value. Well, I'm the uh, Boulder County Consortium of uh, Cities uh, Longmont representatives and uh, representative, and uh, I got the ball rolling on at least having a discussion with the Chamber of Commerce. These stakeholders are important, but we need to hear from workers, we need to hear from the, the business owners, and uh, we haven't gotten the information yet from the survey that the Chamber has uh, uh, done. So. Uh, I think we do need to consider a minimum wage uh, increase, and I think we need to consider uh, the uh, uh, positive aspects of it on our community. Thank you. Our next question. Given Longmont's air quality concerns and shortage of affordable housing, would you commit to voting against any tax incentives intended to bring new businesses to Longmont? I would never say a blanket no to a question like that because there's always extenuating circumstances. But I was at a city council meeting probably six or eight months ago, and there is a group, and Sean, you can help me with this, but I, I want to say it's Imagine Longmont, so. but it's a slightly different name. Um, and they work with the city of Longmont to help bring businesses. The help is with the actual name of the company. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and they're helping to bring businesses to Longmont. Uh, one of the things that I saw on one of the slides is they were talking about every business that comes into Longmont has to do DEI classes for the employees. And I just think that's wasteful and going to be costing a lot of money. There's already a lot of laws about, um, I'm drawing a blank on the word, about discrimination. So with DEI, you're being redundant and you're costing the businesses more money and you're making it harder for businesses to succeed. Well, our Economic Deve uh, Development Authority, in conjunction with uh, Dr. Cog, which is another broad uh, metro area authority, we determine uh, what is going to be the types of businesses that come to Longmont. And so bringing in a business that might possibly be uh, unhealthy for our environment uh, would not be something that I would support and I don't believe our council should support. Uh, I think that uh, right now it's focused on uh, clean business uh, industries. But, uh, you know, I, I think that's part of being part of one of those consortiums, those groups that help uh, drive uh, businesses to our community. Can you repeat the question? Yes. Okay. Given Longmont's air quality concerns and shortage of affordable housing, would you commit to voting against any tax incentives intended to bring new business to Longmont? Hmm. We need growth. We need businesses here. We need to support business growth because with that brings more people into our community. Um, if we need to support them with um, maybe a break with permitting or a break with um, what they're looking at putting in their business, I think that's important. So more businesses, more people we can really develop and work on. And then we get more tax income too. So, And then we'll provide that housing as well. Thank you. We'll have one more round. So our next question. Describe how you see the role of municipal government paying particular attention to whether protecting individual rights versus ensuring that vulnerable populations are not left behind is more important. Say that again. Yes, yes. Yeah. So, so 
describe <clears throat> how you see the role of municipal government, particularly in the area of whether protecting individual rights versus ensuring that vulnerable populations are not left behind is more important. Well, as a government teacher and somebody with a degree in political science and somebody with a ton of experience, I think that uh, the role of government is to do no harm. And, uh, and the idea here is, when I say that, is to make sure that people's uh, rights are protected. But we also have to adhere to the idea that uh, vulnerable populations need our extra support whether it be the LGBTQ community, our Latino uh, and uh, Hispanic communities, or any other community uh, within the boundaries of Longmont and in the surrounding area. So I think that uh, we have to uh, be uh, conscious of that, and we have to recognize that uh, uh, there is no criminality in uh, somebody coming here for a better life for themselves or their children. and. Uh, uh, there is no criminality in being a human, and we need to stop that sort of uh, uh, treatment of uh, people. Uh, we need to make sure that people are treated fair and equitable. Me? Oh, yeah. okay. Um, I, I just, the first thing I would say with that question is I'm gonna acknowledge my privilege as a white woman, um, and I'm here, I mean, we have to stand up for the underserved population. We have got to, to advocate for them because, and not just come around whenever it's election time, not just sit down and be concerned with that whenever it's important for us. We need to be engaged constantly and hear their concerns and their issues so that we can serve them and make sure they're lifted up. I'm having a little problem with the part about we serving them. Um, Everybody deserves an equal opportunity. It's in our Constitution. All men and women are created equal. The difference is what people choose to do with that opportunity is up to them. So if people don't want to help themselves, we should not be enabling them by giving free drugs or free alcohol or anything. We should be giving people opportunities. Thank you. No one's doing that. No one's giving free drugs or alcohol. That's not fair to state, make those broad statements. Okay. Okay. Um, let's move on to our next question. No, it's the lightning. Oh, it's, we are now at the lightning round. Okay, a little palate cleanser. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Where's my survey? <laughs> so just a reminder that we'll start with Becca first and that these are just one word answers. So have you ever ridden a city bus? Yes. Okay. Yes. No. Okay. Next question moving from left to right. Oh no. Sam's or Costco? <laughs> <laughs> Both? Oh, okay. <laughs> Both. Costco. <laughs> okay. Next, going from right to left. Would you ban plastic straws if you could? Yes. Oh, I yeah. think it was hit your, your Yes. Hit. Yep. Oh, yes. <laughs> yep. No. Okay. Question four, going left to right. What? Should Longmont freeze annexations of land? Yes. yes. No. No. Okay. Last question, going right to left. <laughs> what would be your vehicle of choice if money were no object? A Volvo XC90. A Rivia truck. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I wanted to say my horse. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Great. So... Now we're going to move on to the second half of our debate. So we'll start from right to left with Becca getting the first opportunity to answer. Here's our question. What would you do to enlist residents of Longmont more in keeping our city crime free? 
Education. I think if we can communicate with our um, our community and really educate them on what's happening, where their power is, what they can do, um, I'll go to the um, when ERPO was passed. It it passed the power to te school teachers, um, therapists, pediatricians, so where they could report if someone's a harm to themselves, to make sure that they don't have access to a weapon. That to me is education that we can offer to people to know that they are empowered it, and the real risk is suicide. So if we can connect, connect people and build a community around, people are going to understand what's happening and then you have more community involvement in the issues that we're faced with um, here in Longmont. Well, I, you know, I think that a couple of things that we are doing to help uh, uh, the uh, folks in our community that are dealing with mental crisis is uh, the uh, Crisis Outreach Response Program, the core program, going out with our police officers. I think the uh, video cameras in our public places and library uh, and, uh, and other uh, parks and stuff like that. So I think those are some of the uh, ways of, of reducing crime in our community. Plus red light cameras, I think, uh, mm -hmm. could be a real game changer. Yeah. There's been a lot of people that I've talked to that are just really frustrated with the crime and criminals not being punished. We have to find a way, either build a police station in Longmont in 1988, they built one in Boulder, and we're still sharing that one. Boulder had 85,000 people at the time. We've got 110,000 now. We need our own police station, or we need a place that we can put criminals, because criminals have no fear right now. They will steal cars, they'll steal catalytic converters, they'll shoplift, and they have no concerns. Thank you. Our next question, and this will be first answered by candidate McCoy. For Longmont to achieve its zero waste goals, an approach to increased composting must be developed, funded, and implemented. How important is zero waste to you? If you think achieving zero waste goals is important, what do you believe to be the best or most viable approach the city should pursue? Well, uh, personally, I have a composting uh, bin at my house. Uh, we compost most things that uh, we can. Uh, I know that things have changed because of A1, uh, the, uh, the folks that were taking all of our composting and would not uh, take some paper products. I think the city should invest in uh, helping them uh, get a more uh, robust uh, composting, uh, com uh, what is it, uh, it's a, uh, well, they have a facility, but it's the it's the digester that needs to be uh, uh, upgraded, and so I think we can do that. And I think that uh, uh, generally, uh, having served on the RCAB board uh, for the county, I think that's something that we're trying to to make happen. And so it's just a matter of time to get us back to where we were composting uh, a lot or a lot greater uh, percentage of our trash and compostable material. Oh. Oh. Moving right to left. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. um, yeah, I was really bummed whenever that passed and we couldn't compost all the paper materials and whatnot. And I was speaking to our state rep, and she said that it's because a lot of the people who are developing compostable um, items, they weren't truly compostable. So if there could be a way that we can, again, education, this is compostable, this is not, and then have a facility, like he said, or some, we can upgrade that so that we can actually process those compostable items. Thank you. Obviously, nobody's going to disagree with composting. It's a wonderful, easy thing that everybody can do to help the environment. I would like to see more encouragement in having the manufacturers of food and cereal and tools where they put something inside of a plastic container and the plastic container is inside of a box. There's a lot of federal waste that's going on, and not with, the, not with the government, but with the manufacturers, that trickles down to everything that we buy. And as citizens, we could probably speak up to those companies and get them to reduce some of the waste. Thank you. So our next question, you'll answer first, and then Becca, you'll answer next. Or, Sean. Yeah. <laughs> we'll figure it yeah. out. <laughs> so. Should Longmont eliminate parking minimums in residential zones? Uh, 
I'm, I'm trying to figure out what that's in reference to, but as, as far as parking with, you're saying in residential homes? In residential like, homes. Like in a neighborhood, as, as far as how long they can be parked there? or I'm assuming I'm, that is the intention behind the question. I'm not sure. It might be I, related to sure. people parking their vehicles in residential. Okay, so that, that's a very confusing one. Um, there are laws on the books that you can't leave your car or RV or boat parked in a residential neighborhood, I believe, for more than 48 hours. Um, lots of HOAs have restrictions about if you can even park in your own driveway. Um, I wasn't aware of city restrictions about parking in your own driveway or how many cars you can have, but there are street laws about how long you can park a vehicle, and I think that's perfectly fine. Somebody should not be able to park a car in leave it there for months at a time. I, I think this deals with uh, maximums, uh, not minimums, but maybe I'm misunderstanding the question, but uh, I think it's mainly about uh, how many cars one household can have and how long those cars can sit there. If somebody is a collector, they can't just pile up their cars around the corner and everything, or uh, their RV or their boats and, and other things like that. So uh, I, I think that it's what the question's asking, but uh, it's kind of a confusing question. <laughs> um, so I've heard a lot of residents when I've sat in council about talking about they live in like Old Town and there's a lot of cars that park right in front of their house. They can't park there. So I know that is a concern um, if there is a way to have like a designated spot so that they have a car that they can park if they don't have a driveway. So I think that's pretty interesting. But I live in an HOA in a townhome area, um, and if there's too many people in one home, we don't have parking for our cars. So I, I do think that's important, um, especially in those developments where there's only so many parking lot parking spaces. Thank you. Our next question. Becca, you'll get to answer first. And then it'll be candidate McCoy. Candidate Altshuler, we're going okay. right to left, moving towards me. <laughs> <laughs> what is your position on the proposal for a center for arts and entertainment, mm -hmm. and how do you believe that Longmont can position itself as a thriving, thriving hub for the arts generally? Um, it sounds very exciting. I mean, I like what they're, what the um, purposes of it. But the concern is that the first bank center just got shut down. And um, I would hate for that to be a big um, cost to all of us in our community and then it not thrive, especially when there's not a spot yet for the land and how long will it take to develop that land. Um, and you know, I know a lot of people are concerned about, okay, if we're pulling taxes for a very long time, is that money being used properly? How can we allocate that so that we're not being taxed out to live here? So. Well, I'm a big supporter of the uh, uh, Performing Arts Center, and so much so that when Peter Schmidt and I helped start this in 2006, uh, you know, that was one of the big things we wanted to have coming to Longmont, and I think it's one of those things that we should have now. I, as far as to the First Bank Center, I think uh, having used that facility over and over again for different things that I was doing with uh, future business leaders, they were just kind of mismanaged. And I think we're uniquely positioned to be uh, uh, a great distance from Denver and from Fort Collins that I think it'll actually make it work here in Longmont. So I support it. As I've said before, I'm a free market capitalist. I don't think government needs to have its fingers in everything and own everything and build everything. If there was a market for the Arts Center, just like for rec centers, Somebody would come in and build it, and they'd have a business, and they would sell tickets, and it would be profitable. The current museum is about to undergo a remodel, and we have to put in another $8 million because not enough people have gone there to see it and use it. It's great to have it, but it's just tax money that's going down the drain. Thank you. Our next question, and candidate McCoy will answer first. What do you think is the most unique aspect of Longmont that must be preserved at all costs? Um, I think our museum uh, is, a, is a wonderful uh, place, but I think our Main Street Corridor is uh, one of the unique uh, aspects of Longmont. 
our <coughs> business community down there and the, the uh, residential areas that surround it uh, just make it such a unique place that people just drive down Main Street and go, wow, I want to live here. This is one of those communities that people really appreciate. They understand uh, that, uh, yes, 287 is what it is. Uh, there's been all kinds of plans over the years to, to, to take 287 around Kimbark and Kaufman. And uh, there, uh, when other communities like Loveland tried to do that, it killed their downtown. We are different than Pearl Street, and Pearl Street uh, uh, was a unique situation. We're not going to have something like that, but I really think that our downtown area is just really one of our, our gyms. Our parks. I love our parks. I love going to, am I, I'm good, right? Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> uh, Thompson Park, I love taking my kids there. I love um, just the wide open spaces where it's just not, it's not like designated, it's just wide open land where you can run around with your kids and it's just like your own little playing field. So I hope that we preserve that. Sorry. Look, Longmont is a beautiful place. That's why people move here. It, it started, what, 40, 50 years ago. People did not want to live in Denver. They didn't want to live in Boulder. They wanted more open space. Longmont has grown up. It's got great schools, got great restaurants. But I don't want to see Longmont become a high-density housing project that's three, four, five stories high. I know right now you're only allowed three, but they can change that and build more. Nobody that came here to live in Longmont wants it to be like that, but I understand new people want to move here and they want it like that so they can get here. Thank you. Our next question, candidate Old Schuler, you'll answer first, then Becca and then candidate McCoy, or candidate, you know what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> Just guiding. Um, if you were to refocus policing strategies, what would you focus on? Like I said earlier, we need more police. Our police force is stretched very thin. The best strategy we can do is have a way to actually arrest people and get them in front of a judge, and if they're guilty, get them convicted. If there's no punishment, there's going to be more and more crime. The police are doing a phenomenal job. They're, they're shorthanded. If anything, they're the ones that are handcuffed. I would like to change that. We have a governor that said, hey, steal anything you want up to $1,000 and no one will ever punish you. That's just moronic. We can't change the governor's ruling, but when someone's at 1,001, they need to be arrested, they need to be charged, and that's the only way we're going to get a handle on crime is to actually charge and convict the people that are guilty. Um, I was uh, speaking to a couple officers last night at Uni in the community, and um, he was telling me that he is he, I would have 20 more hours of overtime. He is working constantly. He's strapped. Um, I think if we can retain our police officers that are working so hard, that would be great. And then if we can relieve a little bit of that so that people are welcome to want to come in here. Um, so supporting them in the work they're doing and then um, continue to support the, the groups that are traveling with the police officers to mitigate um, mental health crisis. Well, uh, having been a, uh, on the police stand, uh, standards board where we came in and, and when police officers had been accused of stuff. Uh, I feel that our, our police, uh, we do need more police. Uh, we had a shortage of police. We have a lot of police that are in the training uh, mode right now. And I think that if we continue to work with CORE, this uh, uh, crisis outreach response team, I think we can uh, uh, help uh, support our community in a way that uh, we all find humane and supportive. Candidate Venturella, you'll get to answer this next question first. Should Longmont change its electric rate structure to encourage more people to install solar panels on their homes or commercial buildings? Why or why not? If it was easier to get solar, I mean, I'd be there. I know there's a lot of tax credits for it, um, but it's still pricey for my budget. If there was a way that they could help mitigate that process and so I could have solar, I would, I'd be on board. So I think a lot of people would be on board with that. Um, but it's not my expertise, so I'm sure there are people out there, um, well, in our city staff, that are working on this. So if I can team up with them and really learn the ins and outs of it, I think that would um, bring a lot to our community. 
Well, we have a wonderful city staff that uh, actually knows a lot about uh, uh, solar and solar opportunities as well as wind. And I think that uh, uh, all kinds of uh, uh, areas of uh, sustainable uh, energy should be explored. Uh, and uh, I think that uh, uh, if we can make it cheaper for folks, I would be all for it. Again, my answer is based on being in the free market. Solar, a lot of people love it. It can be a great thing. It obviously, in Colorado, we have a lot of sunshine for half the year, but the other half, it wouldn't be very effective. If people want it, that should be great. If they don't want it, they should be entitled. In California, they passed a law that every new home has to have solar on it, which is raising the prices of homes by another forty or fifty thousand dollars per house. So then you end up with higher mortgage and higher rents, and you're going in a circle back to the same thing where people can't afford to live here. So personal choice. Thank you. Our next question, candidate McCoy will answer first, then candidate Altshuler and candidate. Do you believe that density increases for infill development should be limited to a percentage of density over adjacent neighborhoods? Uh, yes, I think that uh, if we're looking at something like uh, some that are being proposed right now, uh, like uh, Office Spruce uh, at Bond Farm, I think there is a deep concern there. Uh, I know that we could go to 108 in that uh, development, for example, but uh, I think, and uh, it looks like uh, the developer would like to go to about 70 or 72 units, but I think that uh, what's more fitting to the uh, uh, surrounding area is probably around 45 uh, to 46 to 50 max uh, of uh, housing. I think that uh, uh, we try to do the right thing when it comes to bringing infill development in. For decades, we ha uh, had it where we, or at least a decade, we have had it for uh, where we um, didn't force anybody to come in, but we made it so that uh, when people did come in, it made it cost effective to the already current citizens of Longmont. So I think we have to be aware of those types of things. Thank you. Okay, I'm all confused now. <laughs> We're getting through it. <clears throat> together. So in every city, there's going to be new construction. And a lot of times, the people that are already there aren't crazy about that. Uh, the project at Bond Farms, the builders brought it down to 66. I know the people that live there want it even lower. And like Sean said, it is actually uh, zoned for up to 108. Uh, hopefully, the people and the builder are going to work together and everyone will be happy. One of the problems with the more, oh, sorry. <laughs> oh, we, have to, we have to be mindful um, with everything. Like you have to keep an eye on it so it doesn't go left real fast. Um, so like I agree with Sean in that. It's like if we can look at the impact on the city and the impact on the neighborhoods in a way and, and sit with the community, I think that's important. So again, Let's be mindful about it and um, aware of that full impact around with high density housing that's coming in. Thank you. Next question will begin with you. Okay. And then you. <laughs> Thank you. <Okay. laughs> so this question is, the city has been approached by a team of designers, investors, and developers to redevelop dilapidated former sugar beet processing factory and the surrounding area. This will require a development partnership with the city of Longmont. What are your thoughts on this and would you support a public-private partnership? Well, they're talking about at the sugar mill and I was there that day when the presentation was made they're talking about over a year of just trucks coming in to haul out the contaminated soil and bring in new soil and obviously haul out the building materials. And then another six or seven years after that to build 2,200 units and a 250,000 square foot arena venue for all kinds of events. Nowhere did I hear any of them talk about the fact that 2,200 units means 4,500 cars every morning and every evening, leaving to go to work or school, 
and then coming back after work or school. When you have the venues that are on, there's probably hundreds and hundreds of more cars. And nobody ever spoke about the infrastructure. So besides eight years of a disaster in the construction, we're, they're not talking about any bridges so that cars can get in and out. It's just going to be a mess, and I think it needs to be looked at a lot more. Thank you. Um, well, thankfully, that um, it's, it's a long process. They're not just going to jump in with one plan. You have to have um, meetings and sit with every developer and every process if it's going to be, if we need bridges, if we need these things. It's not just a, here's the concept, here's the plan, we're doing this. There's going to be a lot of development along the way. I do think we need a partnership because the city cannot be held to pay for the entire thing, the entire development. So yeah, I think we, uh, we need to look at that more in depth. Well, for 50 years that has sat there and sat there and it has gotten older and older. Either we do something about it or we uh, uh, tear it down. This is a, a signature identity of Longmont and, uh, and I think that uh, it's not going to be the level of, uh, of cars in and out because the way the development has been presented, it's going to have people that are living and working there, and it is in that area where we are going to have our transit system. So I really believe that this is the uh, turning point for Longmont, and I support it. Thank you. Our next question, candidate Petronella, you'll be answering first, and then candidate McCoy, and then candidate Altshuler. Should at-large council seats, other than mayor, be eliminated in favor of having smaller wards? And justify your answer. No. <laughs> I don't think so, because you need someone who's doing the overarching, because you, everyone has their concern about their ward. You need someone who's across the board who's going to be like pulling, pulling ideas from the whole community, so it's not just a group of people who are like, ah, but this is what we want, this is what we need. So I think it's important, because I can gain the perspective of the city at a whole, 100,000 people, um, and, and be concerned about what their concern is and look at it as this, like a state rep, like a, a senator, like you can really work on the values that, that we are all concerned together. So, yeah. I, I would agree with that. Uh, the at-large seat is much like a, a, a seat, a, a senator's seat, where they have a bigger and broader uh, perspective of the community. So I think that uh, it's good. It's good for the community. What I would probably propose is that we expand the council to give more representation and uh, allow for uh, another at-large and allow for another district. And then we still have our uh, odd number. We have the seats on the dais to make that happen. And if people feel that they aren't represented well enough, that's one of the ways of making that happen. Obviously, none of us wants to be out of a job. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I think it seems fine the way it is. There's a, I forget the name of the city, but they had something like, maybe it was Chicago, they had something like 40 city council members on the seat on the council and nothing ever gets done. So seven seems like a good number. Everybody knows each other, they work with each other. And obviously if there is a change, it does have to be kept to an odd number instead of an even number for voting purposes. Thank you. Our next question, candidate McCoy, you'll answer first. And this is our last question, okay. I hope I pick a good one. <laughs> Me too. Should Longmont ban the use of gas-powered lawn appliances? Why or why not? Well, I think at some point here, it's not a banning. I think it's just a phasing out. I think we're at a point here that uh, uh, we should give uh, uh, higher incentive rebates to those that uh, would like to go electric. I think it's a, a positive thing. Uh, I think there are some businesses that still need uh, some gas-powered uh, um, lawn type of equipment, but I don't think that uh, that is uh, the trend in the uh, country, across the country, and I don't think that needs to be the trend here. I think just uh, uh, flat out banning them, I, I think it should be more of a phasing out. If we're talking a ban, it's gonna be like a five or a 10 year phasing out and then eventually a ban. And I think that would be a, a, probably within uh, the scope of when majority of people would uh, have uh, already uh, gotten rid of those uh, pieces of equipment. And so I, I think that uh, it's just a 
matter of time for it to happen in the first place. So there you go. Thank you. Oh, okay. So I agree that it should, it should not be banned. That's, again, a lot of government overreach. If there was a better way to use the equipment, people would be doing it. The only alternative right now is electric. And there's not a city in the country that has a strong enough electric grid to handle everything that they're trying to throw onto it, whether it's the electric cars or electric stoves. And, you know, we've seen other parts of the country where they just, everything got shut down in the wintertime because there was no electricity. And that'll happen here if you keep pushing that issue. I was really excited at the state ledge this past session. We passed, um, uh, we were able to pull funding so that we could offer incentives, incentives for people to buy electrical um, lawn equipment. And it just, I think it went to effect just recently. And so if you have, if you go into a store and you want to buy one, then there is um, a discount on that. So I think continuing, again, I go back to education. Like, let's let people know that this is out there, that this is what they have access to, um, so that they have an easier process to moving into buying electric equipment. And I love it. My dad has it. It's fun to use. Thank you. So now we are done with our question Yay. and rebuttals, yes. And we're going to have an opportunity for closing statements, candidate Venturella, we'll begin with you. You have one minute. Okay. Um, I really appreciate um, this being put on. I know it's not easy to do. Um, appreciate all the hard work of everyone. And I'm, I really want to make a change. I, I know that everything cannot be fixed with, with all. It's going to be a process. We have to work together. So I hope that I can work well with our city staff. And I know it will be exciting to really form that bond in that community so that we can look at Longmont as a whole and really try to see how can we bring the community together? How can we um, just create more excitement and, and make people feel really included? Let's try to look at this in this way that we can build a community. And I think that will that'll be a big impact. Um, so yeah, I really hope you vote for me, Becca Venturella. You can check me out on my website, beccaforlongmont.com. And I look forward to seeing you guys out there in the community. Thank you. Candidate McCoy. Well, thank you, Longmont Public Media, for holding this, and Faith for uh, being the moderator again. Uh, you know, again, I'm running to continue to help make Longmont a safe uh, place to raise families and the community members can live and work here. Uh, I'm running to protect our natural resources and quality of life through wise, sustainable environmental practices, through multimodal transportation and clean energy implementation. I'm running to end gun violence in our communities and care for those that are unhoused. Uh, I have the experience, I have the passion, and I really am the only one with 100% preparedness and the experience uh, to uh, uh, start on day one. And uh, I'm not running against anybody here in Longmont. I'm running for Longmont. And so uh, I'm asking you for your vote. Please vote for me, Sean P. McCoy. That's how it appears on the ballot. And go to McCoyForLongmont.com for more information about my campaign. And thank you very much. I love Longmont. I'm running for Longmont City Council because what I've seen from the council, they have a myopic view. All they want to do is get in more money and build more high-density, low-income housing. Longmont has other problems that are getting worse year by year that are being brushed under the rug. One of them is homeless. The amount of homeless people is increasing every single year. Right now, with our southern border, there are millions of illegal aliens that are invading our country. Denver can't handle them all, and we know what's happening in New York and Chicago. According to Google, 5% of Colorado's population are illegals, which means in Longmont we have roughly 5,500 illegals. I don't see them. I don't know where they are. I don't know if they're included in the homeless numbers, but I know it's something we need to be aware of. We need to start setting processes in place. I w I've asked the city council to make us a non-sanctuary city, and they've never even talked about it. So we need to do things to protect the citizens of Longmont. Thank you. This concludes our debate. The next debate begins in one hour. You may stay in your seat for those of you who are attending live, leave the building, or spend time in the lobby speaking to candidates and gathering candidate literature.
please return to the studio no later than 15 minutes before the next debate. The lights will flash and there will be an announcement. And we'd like to thank our friends at the League of Women Voters of Boulder County and Sustainable Resilient Longmont for their help and support. Good job, everyone.